We have with us today as our opening speaker, Congressman Charles Bustani, who is at the forefront of efforts to craft smart energy policy in the U.S. and in our engagement with Asia. Um, many of you already know and admire Congressman Bustani from his work as the co-chair of the U.S.-China Working Group, which has led efforts in Congress to deepen understanding of China and facilitate informed conversations about how to best engage um, with China as the rising power. Um, if you're from Lafayette, Louisiana, you may also know him as Doc, or Dr. Vu, uh, where he ran a medical practice for 14 years before he was elected to Congress in 2004. His duties in Congress include membership in the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, where he's championed a free trade agenda, including important new initiatives such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, his district also plays a very important role in the U.S. energy economy, and Congressman Bustani recently joined 34 other legislators in urging Energy Secretary Stephen Chu to speed up the approval process for construction of LNG export facilities to help meet growing demand in Asia and also improve the U.S. balance of trade. Uh, he has a very keen understanding and interest in foreign policy and the central role that energy policy plays in supporting healthy and secure economies. And I look forward to his remarks. Um, please join me in welcoming Congressman Charles Bustani. Well, Mary, thank you for the very kind introduction. And uh, let me say thank you to NBR and Woodrow Wilson Center for the invitation to be here with you today. And, I want to thank both institutions for the outstanding work by scholars that really helps inform policy makers as we go forward. I, uh, I stand before all of you experts with uh, some degree of trepidation as I uh, come here to speak about energy security and, and the rising demand in Asia, issues which all of you, I'm sure, know much more uh, about these things than I do. But, uh, I think we have to have this dialogue between scholars and policymakers if we're going to bridge the gap and actually solve some of these problems. I, first of all, I want to give you a, a congressman's perspective. I'm not going to come here before you to say I'm speaking for Congress in general, um, but I think having letting my perspective will give you some insights into some of the, the issues, some of the challenges we have in Congress as we try to deal with energy security issues. Uh, first, I think the term energy independence is a term or policy objective that you frequently hear in Congress and certainly amongst the public. And I don't, I personally don't think it's a realistic or a useful starting point to talk about energy policy. And it's not, uh, and it's not useful for policymakers as we try to craft policy going forward. And I, I firmly believe that it's really another form or manifestation of isolationism, in effect. And we have a long way to go, I believe, in convincing the American public, uh, convincing other members of Congress, that we have to step back from that kind of a concept and work from a realistic definition of energy security that integra it's integrated into a broader strategy for the United States. And that strategy has to encompass foreign policy, trade policy, development policy, economic policy, while taking into account the, the best assessments from all of you and, and from all, all sources, best assessments of global trends in all these areas. I, it is only in that way I think we can actually get to the right kind of policy. And I do believe that there has been a systemic failure in our policy approach to energy security. Um, and this is something we're going to really have to work on. Your report, this report, I read it in great detail. And the proof of that is my notes are handwritten by me. They're not, this wasn't given to me by staff. But your report is, a, I, I believe, a very good starting point for this kind of discussion. And the challenge is taking the broad policy concepts, the objectives that you've laid out in this report, and bridging the gap that exists uh, between those objectives and actually policy implementation. That's the challenge we have in Congress. And of course, in the political season, with all the things that we are you know, bombarded with, we have, to, we have to break through that noise and, and eventually get members of Congress to focus on these policy prescriptions 
and figure out how do we actually bridge that gap because far too often uh, I think good ideas, good ideas that you all come up with may able to make it further in the, in the, the uh, spectrum of policy development. And so I believe Congress and the public at large need to be brought into a very informed discussion. Uh, and I think, again, your, your report is, a, is an excellent starting point. The, uh, the report certainly provides an excellent analysis of emerging trends in the implications of Asian, the growing Asian demand. And I do believe it, it provides a useful framework to define energy security. And I think one of the opening essays talks about energy security from the standpoint of supply disruption, uh, from economic shocks and disruptions, uh, and then moves further into the area of global energy security, which I think is a useful concept and something that we need, we as U.S. policymakers need to be thinking about. And that's a theme that's common throughout the report. Uh, there are several policy objectives that I think uh, that were laid out in the report that merit further discussion. And, and I want to sort of lend again a one member of the Congress's perspective on this. I think in trying to consider global energy security rather than energy independence, uh, we clearly need to educate Congress, as I said, and the public about markets, energy markets, broader markets, and the interde interdependence that sort of attends those markets. Um, you know, we still have a tendency to think in isolated terms. Um, what, what was repeated in this report in several of the essays, I've seen it in other work on energy uh, security, is the issue of the International Energy uh, Agency's emergency response mechanism and the deficiency that uh, exists today, because this, this was formulated back in some of the earlier energy shocks, Asian consumers, Asian countries that are big consuming nations, are not part of that emergency response mechanism. And I, I mean, I, I think that's a, a big deficiency that ultimately will have to be addressed in some fashion uh, and we're going to put, you know, clearly from a diplomatic standpoint, economic diplomacy and so forth, we have to come up with uh, imaginative ways to bring China into this. Now, I've had conversations with some of the Chinese leaders about this, and they'll say, well, we're not part of the OECD, we don't want to do that. So we have to kind of get beyond some of those initial barriers to figure out what is, what's the proper evolution of this, because short of bringing these countries in, uh, we're still leaving a very important mechanism in place that doesn't fit the current global situation, and, and, um, and I think we're going to continue to see potential problems there. I believe that prescription for a greater U.S. role in broad economic development in the swing export countries that are described in the report will be certainly something difficult to achieve as, uh, from the standpoint of implementing policy. Uh, part of that is the fiscal situation the United States finds itself in, uh, coupled with the chronic underfunding of our State Department and other arms of diplomacy. But it also highlights, I, I think, a lack of strategy, a, a lack of a strategic approach for promoting trade and integrating trade policy with our foreign policy, our development policy. And I think a lot more work needs to be done bringing those things together. Secretary Clinton talked about uh, development, defense, diplomacy. And that's a nice framework, and I think we have to really focus also on how does trade become a bigger part of that. And I think for too long, U.S. policy has sort of been stagnant in the trade, uh, in the trade arena. And this is an area we're going to have to do a lot of work on. And in looking at those uh, the swing export countries, eastern Siberia, the, the stands, uh, northern Iraq, Nigeria, Angola, Brazil, and, and if we look, you know, scour the, the policy developments in those areas with regard to trade, energy policy, and so forth, I think we, you, you'll see deficiencies. There's a lot of scholarly work on engagement with those areas. But again, we've got to bridge the gap between the scholarly work, the broad objectives, policy recommendations, and actual policy. I think uh, the uh, objective of seeking Asian cooperation for energy security is going to remain a significant diplomatic challenge as we go forward. Uh, that's based on my own limited experience in dealing with Chinese and other other countries as, as we focus on this. And I think it's, it's the experience of others uh, as well. And the literature certainly bears it out. The capacity to handle supply disruptions and the development of open and competitive markets for trade and investment 
It will certainly require vigorous efforts to integrate Asian countries into the uh, International Energy Agency and, and program, you know, again, the, the uh, emergency response mechanism. But, for instance, I know right now the administration is working on the TPP initiative without trade promotion authority. But, but nevertheless, a lot of good work is being done to lay the groundwork for a trans-Pacific partnership. China has to be convinced in this that the goal is not encirclement or containment of China. The goal is integration of China into this kind of trade arrangement. I mean, we've had a standstill with Doha, and clearly TPP is one of the areas where we're trying to jumpstart some sort of multilateral uh, trade initiative in the fastest growing area in the world. And so convincing China of this is going to be a major task, a very difficult task. Because as a, as a balance, you want enough leverage to get China to the table, but at the same time, you don't want to push them away, making them think that this is a, a, an attempt to exclude them in some sort of an encirclement or containment uh, approach. We also have to convince China, again, no easy task, that its, its approach to the South China Sea and the East China Sea is short-sighted in the long run. And that... Uh, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that this is being in part driven by resource uh, nationalism or national, resource nationalism. There are other considerations, security uh, considerations as well, you know, with trade routes and the limitations thereof. But I think we need, this is going to take very vigorous, concerted, uh, multi pronged approaches to diplomacy with China. And it's not going to be easy. I think it's going to be important as it relates to the energy security arena. One area that I've seen mentioned in literature, uh, it's mentioned in your report, is what is the role of the WTO in all of this? Uh, it seems to me, and I'm, I'm not as informed as all of you who are experts in this, but it seems to me that the WTO give, is given mention in the area of energy security, and as we look at energy markets and a U.S. view of what energy markets should be open, open business markets uh, with freedom of the seas and so forth, open access to these resources and reserves. And we know of all the statistics where the international oil companies have limitations in their ability to get to resources. Uh, national oil companies um, have somewhat of, of a tilted playing field. And I think we need, to, we need more investigation as to what is a proper modern role for the WTO framework in, in, the, uh, in this, the, the arena of energy security. These issues of national oil companies is something that's been around for a long time. And we need to, we need to from a policy standpoint, look at how we can provide more clarity and guidance from a policy standpoint on what are the, the rules of engagement uh, how do we how how does the how does this fit into a global open market system? And I, I think this is something I know that's problematic in the TPP negotiations, and it's something that, uh, from an energy security standpoint, global energy security standpoint, I think a lot more work needs to be done in that arena. Uh, I think some of it can be uh, you know some of the work will be done in the context of TPP, and I, I would urge further work in the context of uh, the WTO framework. Another policy uh, objective that was outlined in the report is preparation for fail-safe military protection of the stability of swinging exporting countries and involvement of Asian countries in the protection of Middle East stability and export routes. And I think this is going to require a vigorous imaginative U.S. diplomacy. Uh, and we're working at a very big disadvantage right now, given that what's going on in the Middle East uh, the suspicions in Asia and China uh, in particular. And I think also one of the factors is we're going to have to take into account uh, the lack of capacity to, to create that kind of cooperative environment. Uh, we all know of the, you know, what, what China is doing to try to build its navy, India, and so forth, but there's still a significant lack of capacity. And, uh, and then even with the capacity development, you have a trust deficit, and that's going to be a serious issue as well. And so I think the things that we do today, 
working to, uh, to improve military to military cooperation between the United States and China, military to military cooperation with India, uh, both very difficult uh, policy initiatives. And I know this from my own personal experience when I was in China uh, about a year ago and had meetings with General Chen Mingda and others uh, at a time when our military to military cooperation was at an all time low, or one of the all time lows. And, and uh, we, we had some breakthroughs there, but we have a lot of work to do. And if we're going to engage Asian countries into this broader security framework uh, with regard to energy, clearly a lot needs to be done. And bridging that lack of trust and misunderstanding of intentions that exist today will continue to be a serious challenge. With regard to China and Iran, uh, there's no doubt this is a point that, that creates friction between the U.S. and China. This is well documented in the report. Uh, I think this is a very insightful essay on uh, Chinese thinking about this particular issue. Uh, there's no doubt, I think all of us understand that the challenge that Iran poses to global security uh, and, and the subset of that would be energy security. I, uh, I, I think I take one. I have one question with regard to the author's uh, contention that the veto power that China has at the UN Security Council is really the only lever that China has with Iran. I'm not sure that's the case. I would call for more investigation to look at other other possibilities on how we can engage China uh, with this Iran question, uh, because it's going to continue to be one of the major foreign policy sticking points. And it clearly has energy implications. And I think there's you know, strong interna international sentiment about non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, China has clearly stated they do not want to see uh, uh, nuclear weapon capability in their public statements, at least. Uh, they don't want to see Iran having nuclear weapons. And this is clearly something we need to you know, come up with better ways to engage China on this particular issue. With regard to the sanctions regime that's uh, been imposed, it's clearly having some significant impact uh, on the Iranian economy. I think the impact's being felt more by the people in Iran than by the regime. Uh, and it certainly has not altered the behavior uh, short of just you know, bringing them back to the table in fits and starts for uh, negotiation. But I think uh, the responses of China, India, Japan, South Korea, and the EU have been interesting to watch uh, in all of this. I felt for a long time that sanctions unilaterally imposed would not be, you know, we all know that, that won't be very effective, and that vigorous economic diplomacy would need to be a very important component uh, to trying to help China solve its energy issues, Japan, so that we could put more pressure on Iran. But I think the results have been mixed so far. The jury's still out on this, on, on how successful this has been. But I think it's clearly had some impact, but, it, but the ultimate goal, clearly uh, Iran seems to be intent on moving forward and, uh, uh, with this nuclear program. And, and so I, I think uh, we're going to continue to need to do a lot of work. Japan in particular has been under significant stress uh, post Fukushima. And, uh, you know, what they ultimately do with their nuclear program, uh, their nuclear power program in Japan, uh, remains to be seen. I think they, they made a very strong statement and they subsequently backed off. But uh, I think uh, this is an area where Japan clearly took some bold steps to reduce its dependence on Iranian oil. And, and um, you know, I think, again, we're going to continue to need to do much work in this area. With regard to liquefied natural gas, uh, this has been described as a game changer. It's clearly a monumental development, uh, at least in the United States role with shale development uh, and the potential for exports. This is playing a big role, a big potential role, and could really shake up energy markets, in my opinion. My district, as was stated uh, earlier, is, uh, is kind of at the epicenter of all this. Uh, the company Chenier Energy, I, I've worked with them. Uh, since they built that facility to receive imports. And my office has been very deeply involved in helping them uh, kind of negotiate the permitting process and they've moved along. They're planning construction now. Uh, I've got two other LNG companies right there in my district that are also working their way through this permitting process. 
I think, you know, clearly stated in the report, the global demand for LNG is uh, it's well addressed in the report. We all know of the significant growth in the Asia Pacific region. And a uh, couple, of, couple of points I want to make about the United States and its role with LNG development, and particularly with regard to exports. We still have a lot of policy uncertainty in this area. I mean, there are members of Congress calling for a restriction or a complete moratorium on exports. Uh, there are divisions within our own uh, economy and, uh, with regard to public opinion about whether this is a smart thing to do. Uh, the chemical industry, for instance, they want to make sure that we retain that, that natural gas in this country and use it to uh, you know, as input for our feedstock for chemicals and, and petrochemicals that we could then export. Uh, there, there's discussion about using natural gas as a, as a part of a, a bridging strategy or transition strategy in the transportation area. These are all important developments. I think it's too early to tell what happens. Of course, all the concern for the U.S. is what would be the impact on prices. We've seen a great deal of volatility in the U.S. in the past with regard to volatility in natural gas prices. But I think uh, my sense is that with the right balance of policy, you'll see a slight uptick in the cost of production of natural gas. Uh, and, and Well, not necessarily the cost of production, but the actual co- price, price signal for natural gas. Right now it's low. It's 2 to $3 per million BTUs. And that, that's actually too low to promote drilling. I'm hearing from a lot of companies who say, well, we're just sort of you know, holding off right now. Uh, so we have to look at how to get price stability where it's not too low and yet not too high. But in, the interesting development it has been a decoupling of natural gas prices in the United States from oil prices, which creates a major arbitrage opportunity for the United States. So the, the key questions here are policy uncertainty as to what direction we go with regard to exports. Secondly, uh, the, the need for infrastructure development and maintenance of infrastructure to allow for those exports. And I can give you an example. In my district, uh, we have dredging problems on the ship channel where these tankers will have to you know, come in and go. And without solving that problem, and I've got legislation that I've tried